look, I'm getting these really funny heartbeats. Oh, that's anxiety. Other aspects of lifestyle which may be relevant. Be patient with yourself and just build up gradually. So I just needed to have them work with me. There's a whole bunch of cardiomyopathies. Benefits of doing genetic testing. Take their own heart monitor. There's better types of fat. Try and find a cure for inherited heart muscle diseases. Uh, what, a, what a great event. I hope you've had, been having a, a great day so far. I'm Malcolm Finley. I'm a consultant cardiologist at Bart's Heart Centre just down the, down the road. I also do my outpatient clinics at Whips Cross Hospital, um, which is uh, really in the, in the thick of it, the real world, not in the ivory tower in central London. Um, I think it's always good just to say I'm involved in loads of all this stuff. Okay? I'm not talking about anything today which I've got any financial associations with. Um, but I, yeah, I'm really proud to have been involved in lots of medical devices. So I work a lot with medical device companies and part of my research has been, uh, has ended up being developed into medical devices to help people with abnormal heart rhythms and also with heart muscle, uh, heart muscle disease. Um, okay, so uh, I think there's been this wave front of new heart monitors that we can do our, you know, take our own pulse with, take our own ECGs with, do our own blood pressures and so on. And this is, is hard for me to catch up. So this, having, having this sort of presentation is a great, has been a great opportunity for me to go down and really refresh what the now is about heart monitors. So I wanted to go through a few things, um, but I should say, first of all, that if there are any questions, we can all stop, change tack, if you think I'm going along some route which is boring or there's a pressing question, just put your hand up, interrupt any, any time. Really happy to just uh, work through back and, back and forth. Um, so what are the different types of cardiac monitor? And I guess with that, what's the difference between self-monitoring and the stuff that we do in the hospital? Um, and to go through what types really are available to us, you know, really actually available, not just the sort of sci-fi stuff that we see on the news every so often. Um, and uh, with all that, what do they do? And maybe most importantly, the one thing I always want to know, and people in my clinic always ask me, which one's best? Um, and I can't, I'm not advertising Apple or any of these Fitbit or any of those other things, but uh, spoiler alert. Okay, so uh, I guess this is the major thing. Like, we have all this information from Apple, Fitbit, Google Health, uh, Amazon Health, you know, everyone wants us to be giving us their, you know, their health data, um, and Withings and uh, Omicron and these huge, huge organizations, but what, what's the point? And as an arrhythmia doctor, so specializing in heart rhythm problems, the key point in my clinic is to try and relate people's, what's actually happening with their heart at the time they're developing symptoms. So that may be someone saying to me, I get really breathless out of the blue when I climb the stairs. Do I, and I want to know what their heart rate is doing then. Other times people saying I have palpitations. Other times people have had a blackout. And I want symptom arrhythmia correlation. So what somebody feels and what their heart's doing at that time. And I think my view of self-monitoring has been very much that that has been, that has been something that the modern world of our own monitors has really unlocked. Um, but there are also, there's also another layer to that, which is monitoring our health over time, engaging with our health, and giving us clues to other symptoms. What I don't think it's for is, I think, the there's a sort of group of people who are really keen on reassurance with their self-monitors. I don't know, has anyone, got a, anyone here got a, wearing an Apple Watch? Or I'm actually not wearing an Apple Watch. I mean, some people fall in two camps, right? Some people go, ah, oh, it's so reassuring. But I don't find that everybody, people sort of say, well, it's not that reassuring, <laughs> actually, you know, because if I've got the chance to check it, I'm, my heart's still beating, I think that's, that's very, that's very reasonable. 
Okay, this is a this slide, a lot going on, but this is like my thinking about what's available to us as far as uh, direct heart monitors. So we've got all the in-hospital stuff. You're wired up to a big box, and the nurses can go, half the time it will bleep and stop you from sleeping. But that's what we use in hospital, and really that is for one purpose, and that is I mean, the main reason for being wired up all the time is that if something disastrous happens, then the nurse can run in and we can get a cardiac arrest team out and make sure a disaster doesn't happen. Self-monitors do not do that, or at least none really at the moment. Um, and I guess ICDs, we can uh, implantable cardioverter defibrillators, kind of have that role in the community, but that's, that's where this sort of thing stops. Okay, but it's this lot which is interesting for self-monitoring. So 24-hour tapes, 7-day, 48-hour tapes, 7-day monitors, Two-week monitors. Anyone had one of those before? In there? Yeah, so, you know, we've all kind of experienced what, what that's like. Sticky pads, you know, waking up in the shower two weeks later, finding a, <laughs> finding a patch migrated somewhere. The sun doesn't shine. Um, that is, but they have a really important role to play. But as most people who've had one of these know, if it's for symptoms, you put them on. Oh, I don't have any symptoms anymore. <laughs> then you take it off and, phew, oh my gosh, there it goes. So we have that real problem of a, of, a, of a very limited window for the time. And actually, sometimes in the NHS, you order one. You come in and say, oh, well, we'll need to do a 48-hour tape. Here you are, book it in next month, next month. Christmas cards arrive next year. Happy New Year. You know, this. Then <laughs> summertime, you know, oh, well, come on up for your 48-hour Holter monitor in September, and then we've kind of lost the, lost that whole sort of let's get stuff done. The, we've lost our um, thrust to get things done. Uh, and a, ma a major advance here has been these sort of patches and also monitors that you put on yourself because that can cut out that waiting list. So when we do need continuous high quality monitoring, um, these can be really a really good way for people to have continuous non stop ECGs. Uh, and if two weeks is not long enough, if people have blacked out, and I'll talk about this in more detail, we have implantable monitors as well. What we mainly think about with all this are the, is this side. They're the sort of things that measure your pulse and do stuff for your pulse, and that includes our early smart watches and the early Fitbits that sort of first started kicking around about 10 years ago, I guess. Um, and uh, blood pressure monitors with something in addition. So a well, blood pressure monitor has an AF alert capability and so on. And then we've got the, what we mainly think about, the ones trying to give gold standard or at least near gold standard data, the Apple Watch, the Fitbit, the uh, Cardio Mobiles, uh, and there's Withings as well. There's many, many manufacturers. Okay, so here's just a, I mean, you know, it's always nice to think about people rather than just the technology. So this is kind of the typical thing that will come up to my clinic. Someone who, a uh, 74-year-old chap who's, uh, a true story, um, normal, had a, was told he had a normal heart five years ago uh, when he had a routine echo. Uh, and he blacked out. I was sitting down on the transatlantic flight in premium economy. I mean, that serves him right for not paying for business class. <laughs> I would say that if you're 74 flying transatlantic, you know, you may as well. <laughs> I'm an economy, don't I? Uh, so, um, yeah, I'd been told to come on up to someone in premium economy who's just collapsed. Right? Um, uh, so what sort of monitor would, would we do for a chap like this? Anyone want to hazard a, hazard a guess what would be? This sort of thing I ask medical students, and there's no wrong answer. It's all right answers. Uh, you know. An ECG, 12 lead ECG, of course. Let's make sure everything's normal. Um, and then he sort of goes to, he gets taken to, what's the, Hillingdon Hospital? That's where you, if you black out on the way to Heathrow, they wheel you off to Hillingdon. You know, if you haven't died on the flight, you'll die there. Um, <laughs> it's okay. My <laughs> actually, I actually have a close relationship with Hillingdon Hospital. <laughs> My grandparents both passed away there, so, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I can... <laughs> Um, and yeah, don't laugh at that, but you know what I'm you know. Um, What sort of monitors are most appropriate for these, these people? So they're discharged, ECG is normal, echo is normal, off, off you go. So um, go ahead. It's what about a two week monitor? 
two-week monitor, I think that's a great idea. So someone who's blacked out, uh, you know, had a one-off blackout, you want to have a, as long as possible, really, to make sure that overnight you're monitoring them fully all the time so they don't have to do anything because they've had a blackout, they've gone like this. Another option would be an implantable monitor, so one which is there the whole time for a year or two years uh, because actually we, this may have been a phase of eagle on the, on the flight and that's probably what, what happened. And that's a, that's a true story. Um, and these are the implantable monitors. This is the sort of thing that if someone has a blackout and loses their ability to do something, this type of, you, you won't have a chance to check your ECG on your watch or put a patch, patch on, you know, take your pulse, take your blood pressure, this sort of thing. Uh, you need something that is there the whole time. Um, and this, these types of monitors really change the game. Uh, Medtronic led the field, and this is Medtronic 1, but all the major med tech manufacturers have one. These are called uh, implantable loop recorders, and Reveal is their kind of um, uh, brand name, uh, and we put them in, in the outpatient. So a local anesthetic injection, it can be injected under the skin, a little plaster and some stereo strips. It can stay the battery life of this one, which is the most common one. It's about the size of a pen lid, and uh, it lasts for about two years. There was one that I was showing last week um, which is a seven-year monitor. So, you know, you might say, well, if you haven't caught it in two years, you're doing pretty well. What's the point of having a longer monitor? But, you know, we'll, we'll know these things. So they're great, but they are for unheralded collapse. So if someone goes down, they're great. But they're invasive, and as you expect, they're expensive. Not just a little thing, but the whole, uh, you know, the whole going to a doctor or going to the hospital to have it injected in. So it's... Uh, not something you can do yourself. Go, go. So expensive, how much? Yeah, so their list price is 2,400 pounds, okay, for the device itself. Okay, there's another two expenses. There's the outpatient appointment, da, da, da. Yeah, put all that in. But then there's the monitoring. So these things keep on giving data. So they, this box beams it to the hospital. And so imagine that the device is picking up you know, you're going to play tennis, and so it gets some interference, and then it pings the call center to, oh, he's having an arrhythmia, and no, he's not, he's just playing tennis again, like he does every Saturday. This is the sort of issues we have when we over put these in. I have a patient, go ahead. Oh, yeah, Malcolm, I was just gonna ask, does this go in our heart or under our skin? So, so thanks, that's a, great, that's a great point. These are under the skin, so these are an injection under the skin. They're about the size of a pen lid, so really a very, very tiny, uh, tiny monitor, um, the reveal link or implantable loop recorders. So it's not, not, a, not a major, go ahead. Stupid question, presumably when it's run out, you take it out again. Yeah, we can do, I mean, or you can, you can leave them in, they're sort of, sort of inert to the human body, so um, most young people will have them taken out, most old, older people will leave it in, and it's up to you whether you decide who's young or who's old. But I bet, I think, I think everyone here is extremely young, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah, so they, they're really great, but they're not perfect. Um, okay, these are the classics that we've all heard of. A monitor, a recorder which is stuck to our skin the whole time. We've spoken a bit about this. So these are, we, you know, you use the same box there, but we have that real problem, it gives us loads and loads of ECGs, and you're likely not to have the symptoms when this thing is on. Why is that? Because yeah, great question. That is a great question. Why is it we have such a low pickup? So we've done the, we've had a look at this, and it is true that we have a lower pickup rate, and we haven't got proof, but I think when, you have, when you're wearing a monitor, you don't do the things you normally do. I mean, do you want to go swimming with a heart monitor? No. Do you feel like going, why don't you go, oh, I'll do a big shop this weekend. I'm going to go on a holiday. I'll go pop over to the, the countryside to see. You know, so people actually, you know, just closing their life a bit while they're wearing the monitor. They keep themselves less stressed than they would normally. And we've got, and we absolutely know about the stress and heart interaction, which is another yeah, next year you can ask me to talk about stress and heart interactions that I love talking about because the brain and the heart work together and this is a, it's a real thing. So, um, although seven days, people get used to it and they, you can't 
kind of close oneself off for a full seven days, or you can, but not many people do. So seven days are much better than a than a, just a 48-hour holiday. I'm actually going to have to send a two-hour one on in December, but purposely I've got to have it on the day before I do my cardiac rehab. So I've got to wear it while I'm at cardiac rehab to sleep better. I think that's, uh, yeah, that's very, I mean, that, that, that sounds like you've got very... It's going to feel like very, I, th I mean, they're very, they're very straightforward to wear. They're very straightforward to wear, but they kind of give something they're a little bit different from our health, our, our own, you know, our, our, um, our own monitors. I've sort of just got another um, real case here, um, which is, yeah, so this, this is another real case, another person in their 70s who's uh, like doing exercise, but then they, every so often they were doing exercise, they just felt dreadful. Um, and really, like, their exercise tolerance just disappeared away from them. And someone has said, you know, maybe you need a pacemaker. So any sort of ideas of what sort of monitors would, when this person came to me saying the sort of monitor? Anything? Go ahead. Stress echo. Say again? Stress echo. A stress echo. That's a, I, th I think a stress echo is a, great, is, a, is a great idea. I was actually thinking less about, that will show us the heart pumping function, where there's disease in the, in the heart arteries. So... We um, so the part of the blood study not get it. Say again. Physiologist, check the physio. To check for pacemaker. I would say I would say here. What I was go ahead. So the VO2 max test. Okay, all great questions, right? Not what I was thinking here. <laughs> so I have in this person. I didn't do a stress echo. I did an echo. Okay, that was not you know so structurally normal heart. We did a. Uh, we did a physiology test, a VO2 max test, where we got someone on the bicycle as far as they can go. Nothing really happened. They kind of, kind of could cycle fine. So a loop recorder, that would be reasonable, but it's an expensive and invasive study. Go ahead. Exercise test. Exercise test. Again, the VO2 max is kind of, is basically a fancy exercise test where you also take out the, uh, you work out the, the respiratory, respiratory load. So thus far... I wasn't really going much further. 48 hour tape. So 48-hour tape. Zio. Zio getting, yeah, OK. So I'll tell you what I thought. Because <laughs> okay, I think we've had every, everything we mentioned here. Okay? I thought, well, you're getting, a, you're, you're getting a intermittent. You exercise. You kind of like your exercise. We've done a couple of tests. They've all been ne negative. Why not? You feel dreadful, but we're not having dreadful, we're not having life-threatening symptoms here, you're just feeling dreadful, why not get one of these? Actually, a smartwatch or card, one of, one of those. So they can, when they felt unwell, they could then take their own heart monitor, not just the heart rate, but actually record an ECG and ping it up to me. That happened, lo and behold. <coughs> Quite a while later, two, three months later, I got an ECG showing atrial fibrillation. And then we treated that, and then things, things have been fine. So these, um, we don't necessarily have to go to that heavy, deep medical to get the answer. And let's face it, it's the answer for the, pay, for the people we're sort but of trying to help. But you're able to read that all the time. I mean, they must have thousands of people. Hold on. Okay. We're going we're gonna, to we're <laughs> go into that, OK? So, OK, so what I want to do now is just go through the different types of so we've done kind of like the monitors in the hospital, and what about the monitors we can get at home? So blood pressure. Who's got a blood pressure monitor? Yep. Um, yeah, everyone's, yeah, great, great, the right answer, because we all monitor our blood pressure. But a lot of these will also give us not blood pressure. They'll tell us our pulse, and many of them will tell us whether our pulse is regular or irregular and have an AF warning thing. So um, I thought it was kind of interesting to say how they work. So the blood pressure cuff inflates, it detect, as it reaches a certain point, you lose the vibration of the pulse. So as the, the artery wall is squeezed shut by that, that cuff, the, uh, the, uh, this has a detector in for the vibrations of that pulse. As the blood pressure cuff releases, it starts to sense that little pulse vibration. And that goes to a point where it sort of maxes out. And by that time it's maxed out, the blood pressure cuff has gone down enough. And so when it's really squeezed, that's the systolic pressure. And when it's fully 
you know, when it's maxed out, that's the diastolic pressure. So that gives us those two numbers, the systolic and the diastolic number. And the frequency of that pulse, how fast that is, well, that's your pulse rate, right? And so it's doing something, it's kind of working out the pulse, not every beat, not every reliable, it's sort of inferring that from these vibrations that come back from the monitor. That's fine, but it can be really fooled if you have any sort of arrhythmia, if the pulse isn't really regular. So, uh, let's see, is this, it? yeah, so I think they're really, really important for anyone on blood pressure medications, anyone dealing with their own heart condition, to be able to have that, their own blood pressure monitor is super important. They're accurate at blood pressure, but they're inaccurate at detecting abnormal heart rhythms. I'm just looking at the time here. Yep, we're still, we're still here. Um, there was a question that I had, uh, which came through on email, and it said, um, what is the optimum blood pressure and heart rate for people with cardiomyopathy? And I think that's a great question. What's the best? I mean, we have the, and the guidelines would say people with lower blood pressure, if your blood pressure is lower, the better, right? <laughs> However, the lower it gets, more symptoms people get. So you have, oh, your blood pressure is 100 on 70 in the clinic, and then you bend over and you black out because you sort of start. So that's no, that's no life, right? So we're balancing all these things. And actually, the winners, uh, this slide here, this is the kind of classic guidelines where you've got the, um, the blood pressures with the upper number being above 90 and below 120. That's what the, the blood pressure doctors are telling us is the optimum. They're saying that's normal. And then most of us in the Western world will be running in this pre-hypertension band, which I think is a bit critical of us, but um, that's, the way, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the way we're living. So if people have high blood pressure, I clinically try and treat them down to below 130. That's a systolic number, but then it's, uh, and usually below that, that, that's the top end of when people can start to get symptoms. Yeah, that's a really, that's a really good question. And I think the answer, unfortunately, is, uh, let me see, is really complex about how the blood, the blood vessels and the heart interact. And there's that whole kind of the kidneys and the heart interacting, the blood vessels <laughs> having the, the way the blood vessel tone can change, how well they can squeeze. Okay, so classic things are making sure one's well hydrated, right? That's a classic thing. The other thing is we go on to low salt diet because everyone's been telling us we have to be on a low salt diet. But if people are getting symptoms from hyper chronic hypotension, then you need a certain amount of salt in one's diet as well. And by salt, sodium chloride, as well as the other, the other potassium chloride and so on. Um, so it's kind of, a, unfortunately, it's a bit of a complex answer, which I know an oversight from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, here we are. Um, let's go back. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to mention is the old style pulse meters. So I say old style. They're not actually, you buy, buy these. If you buy the Apple Watch SE, the sort of cheapest one of the Apple Watch sort of series, if you have the Fitbit, the sort of, the sports watches with a heart rate monitor usually have this sort of green light at the back which detect, is detecting your, your pulse. Um, and that is detecting in a similar way to those finger prick, those, sorry, finger prick, the finger pulse eximeters. Um, as uh, the blood, the, the tiny vessels dilate uh, with every heartbeat, the absorption of a green light, which is really absorbed well in the red blood, changes. And that is how it detects the pulse. So it has to be sort of pressed against a wrist, but they're pretty accurate at detecting the pulse. But what they do is give us this sort of wavy line trace rather than giving an electrical trace of the heart. So these are really good at monitoring 
trend of heart rate. They're less good for diagnosis. You can do some inferences. So if this becomes very irregular, both in timing and in the volume of the pulse, you can infer that that is almost certainly atrial fibrillation. But they're still one step back from being diagnostic. So if a patient comes to me with a tracing um, from, a, so from one of these pulse monitor devices or, or watches, says, it says I've got atrial fibrillation, I should get checked out. I don't say, right, that's atrial fibrillation. I would say, we need to do another test. We need to do, get ECG evidence. And then we're back to, you know, Malcolm Finley saying, well, I'll get you a seven-day monitor. Oh, gosh, that hasn't shown anything until the day after you took it off. And then da 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 So these are limited in terms of their medical use. They're pretty good at screening. So if someone has one of these things and it shows something, gets you to go and see a doctor, but they're limited in uh, diagnostics. You can also get the blood oxygen levels from these. They seem to be pretty accurate, actually, and they look, use a slightly different way of doing it than the, than the classic red ones on the, finger, uh, on the finger. And the last thing just to mention is every so often, you sit, and I might have a slide on it in a, yeah, on, every so often you have ones that say they can measure blood pressure. And there are a few which kind of claim a blood pressure accuracy. And they tend to be ish for that. They tend to be okay for trends, but they're not, I think there's only one which is actually, has got any claimed real accuracy. When you look at the, them in detail, they're always sort of like, this should be used for interest only, this is for your, and it's a bit hard, I find, just if, if I didn't know deeply about things, it's a bit hard, because some of the devices which say this is only for trends, not medical device, da da da, are just as good as our medical devices, whereas other ones are kind of not so good. And these ones would be not great for daily blood pressure monitoring. Those cuffs that we spoke about early, earlier are far, far superior. Which one is the best? You said there was one that was accurate. Oh, I, I've got to say, I, it's a small company, and I forget the name, but it's a slightly, <laughs> slightly different band, and it was, oh, came out... It, it, wasn't, it wasn't on my list. It wasn't on my list. Not, not no, because I heard about the... I don't actually know if it's commercialized. I've just seen the data from it. So, I feel, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. I should, should have got that. But I, I haven't seen that in the wild, okay? I haven't seen that Omicron one in the wild. The Omicron ones are very... Omicron is a gr generally great brand, great brand we, for clinic and, uh, and monitoring. But the wrist monitors that do the pulse, they... they say they can get your blood pressure from the pulse, you've got to be a bit, you know, it's okay for monitoring trends, but not very good for monitoring absolute, absolute numbers. Okay, I think that's what it says there. Okay, so in my line of work, when I'm super interested in the actual tracing of the heart, I'm, the idea that you could get an ECG from a handheld monitor when this first sort of started kicking around about 15 years ago was this change, this changes everything. You know, this, um, the idea being that you have an alive core, this device was the very first of the ones easily available, essentially a little card with two electrodes and you place your electrodes, on either, your electrodes, place your hands on the electrodes and that basically takes an ECG as if it was taking this vector across the heart. So it detects then the little potential differences which are the ECG. That harks back to the very first ECGs ever performed. Any idea where they were done? Anyone know? In? Yeah, actually true, but they didn't publish it. And so it was a guy in Mary's called Waller who first did an ECG and he thought it was a, just a curiosity. So it was a Dutch guy called Einhoven about 105 years ago who first did an ECG and you used to look at these that was in the, who first did an ECG and published it. And that original device is in the Science Museum in, um, in uh, South Ken. And the way it worked is you'd put your feet in these buckets and hands in buckets of saline, <laughs> and then it would go and there'd be a little toy train on a spring that goes along with a photographic plate, 
and the little the sunlight had you could only do it once a day, right? Just at the right time when the sun was in. Go like and there'd be a little flicker of the ECG on the photographic plate, you take it one up, develop it, and two days later come back and say, Yeah, sinus rhythm, right? So, so that was a, it was quite amazing how it how it was performed then. And this kind of harks back to them when you only have two electrodes connecting across the heart and hands, you know, so it's just the same thing that they were getting getting all the way back then. So there's a little nice little bit of history there. Is there any ones that are homes that you can use to go and ICD? Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, I was going to um, mention this. So these are passive, so they don't give out any electrical signals. And so actually, all of these monitors, even though the interpretation may not be accurate, the ECG tracing will be accurate, or at least relevant, and perhaps most importantly is they're not dangerous. They are fine for people to use no matter what pacemakers, ICDs, loop recorders, whatever people, um, or the conditions people, ha people have. So the way I think about these is they enable opportunistic recordings. So if and when someone has a symptom, they can take a gold standard recording that they can then take to their cardiologist or doctor or GP and say, this is what was happening to my heart when I had that done. Um, so it gives proof of arrhythmia. It needs a little bit of time because even with the, even with the watch based uh, monitors, you need that moment of recognize, oh gosh, I'm feeling unwell. Right, I go to the app, turn it on and then record. It takes moments to do that, but those moments may miss something. Um, and so it can give us this, that thing I said right at the beginning, symptom arrhythmia correlation. Are they accurate? So this is a friend of mine, a um, patient of mine, uh, who's, uh, I told me he was getting palpitations and he emailed me this trace. Um, this was atrial, this is atrial fibrillation and he's had an ablation to cure that. Um, this is a beautiful tray. So I see that. It takes me like instantly. Da, 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 da. N nothing else gives you a fast heart rhythm like that, which is irregular. Okay, and there's some irregularity in here. Beautifully done. So yes, they are accurate. Can I just say something? I've got one of them. I just can I just can I go like this? Yeah, 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 sorry. Are they accurate? No. <laughs> is that is that is that, well, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is because of that first thing. Those, it's a long way away from the, the heart. If one isn't properly relaxed when one takes it, like physically, take, you get muscle interference on these things. If you move your fingers, ever, even like not noticeably on those little patches, it can, you can get this sort of interference pattern. And, so, and then if it's bleeping up at you saying, the wrong diagnosis, say, like, you're feeling fine, it's telling you've got atrial fibrillation and vice, and, uh, and vice versa, say, emergency, go to the hospital right now, and then you think, oh, okay, I'm just, just showing it to my grandson, you know, or, you know, or whatever the, um, then this will be, uh, so it's not all like a tracing like this, often you get things like that, and that is about technique, the contact of your fingers and so on. Um, so the modern smartwatches, sort of got around this. And another little bit of history, uh, modern history. Uh, the, so Apple started putting that ECG recording on their wristwatch. AliveCore has started doing that about three or four years before Apple, selling a watch strap and a app for a watch which could record the ECG recognizing all this. Apple went and did it, AliveCore sued, so, and went all the way to the US Supreme Court a uh, live call won, and so now every time you take your ECG on an Apple Watch, a live call get 50 cents or whatever the, you know, I don't know the actual result, but it was a massive win for that small company. So they're doing great, whichever one you, whichever one you, whichever one you pick. Um, so that's 
Uh, so, I will say, I will say in a slide or two, I'll give you my verdict, right? So look, there's all these different ones you can have. The Apple Watch, then you have the sort of Fitbits, and I noticed most of the new Fitbits actually have that capability. Not all of them, but most of them do. And the Withings one, you see that, you think, you don't even notice it's like a smartwatch, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's an actual watch with actual hands. And if you're sort of a... Uh, you know, middle-aged bloke, I don't know who you, that might be. You might want a fancy watch. If anyone's going to buy me anything for Christmas, I'd quite like it. No, I'm not wearing <laughs> Keep on leaving it in the catheter lab. Uh, are they generally safe to wear large shoes? Yes, they are. They sure are, yeah. Um, even very fancy ones with hands, right? <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, so we, we know all this. This is um, record ECG when you need it. Uh, they monitor your pulse intermittently. So on their n nominal settings, they kind of every minute, every half an hour, they'll, what's the pulse doing? Da -da -da, check it and then quieten down. You can change that in the settings. So there is a sort of intensive health monitoring. So you can have it monitoring the whole time. I haven't actually had anyone who's found that useful yet. Um, but this is, some, this is on the wrist of someone I hope will find it useful. That's my dad, who I bought an Apple Watch for after he had a funny turn on an airplane. Um, and, uh, he, yeah, so we can also monitor the oxygen saturations. And if you look in the instruction, it says, this is not a medical device, it's for your general health, da da da, da but Look, this is, this is the, the, the standard of this recording. Like Everyone comes up to me sending me this kind of recording of Trace where I can really tell what's going on. And this one's from the Apple Watch, but it's just as much for the, um, it's much, just as much from the other watches with an ECG. You don't have that, or at least you massively reduce that whole thing about having the double the, the uh, interference with the watches. So generally, we get great tracings and generally they're diagnostic. Even when on the packet, it says this is not a diagnostic medical device. Okay, so um, it's always on. It's easy to use if symptoms occur. So this really takes away a load of those, kind of anyone who has intermittent symptoms, this kind of can give an answer to. Um, it's really accurate. And it also does loads of things, and they're, not, they're pretty fancy. They're, not, they're nice bits of jewelry. Um, but they can be bulky, they can be, uh, and they can be pretty expensive. I mean, you can spend yeah, a lot of money on, on something like this. So I thought it was useful just to do a very quick you know, Apple versus Google, um, you know, the Fitbit versus the Apple Watch. So, uh, I mean, I think this was written by, you know, these things were, uh, you know, from a tech uh, sort of more of a tech person, consumer than a, a doctor. But you know, people generally, you know, Apple has got their one design, but Fitbit has, and there's a huge range of different designs. They are all really good ECGs. They all track all the vital measurements. Um, you know, if geolocation, GPS is important to you, well, you know, the Apple Watch has that, but not all the other ones have. Uh, the Apple Watch battery life, well, it's a charge every night. Some of the other ones will work all week. That's important to some people. But you see, what I'm not mentioning here is which one's better at health tracking, because they're all great. They're all absolutely great. Um, the best, let's say the best, cheapest one, if you see what I mean, the best, cheapest one that's worthwhile seems to be the fit, one of the latest spot in the range Fitbits with ECG. So it changes, it's like series, it's number six in their, um, in their, you know, in their catalog. So we're talking to, well, it's Black Friday, right? So things may be 20% off right now. <laughs> so but to, what I saw is, to, yeah, so 219 pounds for the one with the ECG, yeah? So for the, for the Fitbit. That's 30 quid. That's 30 quid. And it does the ECG. Yeah, that does ECG. Oh, okay. Well, you know, 
So there we go. There we go. Yes. You can set it to alert, which yep. I wouldn't because it just continues. There, there's a, there is a, uh, yeah. I mean, you've had great experiences there. You've had great experiences. Yeah. Okay. So there are people who need, can't do that measurement when they're having symptoms. And you can think of people, uh, you know, the examples I've got are sports people who get symptoms in doing competitive activity, and a lot of those devices need to be tethered to a phone to really have all the functionality. So the Apple Watch, um, you know, although you don't need to have it tethered to the phone all the time, it, doesn't, you know, it can be a standalone device, a lot of that ECG functionality needs the phone nearby. Um, and some of those implantable recorders also can transmit to a phone and so on, but that phone needs to be nearby, and if you're on a 200-mile cycle race, then that won't be that won't be possible. Go. Ahead. Yeah. yeah I've, for many years, I had a Garmin 35. Right. And I'm going to replace it with a Garmin 45, which is just a bit more. Yep. Yeah. I've got uh, OS app on my phone. Okay. So I always know where I am. Yes. And ICG fitness. Yes. Do you need all of that? Yeah, because I've got an ICD. Yeah. I'd always know where I am. Yeah. <laughs> and, and because I can set the low rates and high rates for my heart. And yes. Level, yes. So I need to spend 283 rather than 125. Uh, I would say you don't. Okay, you don't need to. But you might find that it's quite fun to have the fancier yeah, one. Yeah, that's, that's another true. question. But, you know, I, I think it's a real thing because we're, you know, in our cult in... British culture, yeah, we tend to think like this. I mean, we often don't think it as a culture thing, but yeah, we often look at those sort of prices and say, "Whoa, well, we'll have a like that 125 is 280." Well, I was in, when I was in the States a couple of weeks ago. I mean, people just think like that's a, just a crazy way to think, and just you know, get the fancy one. That is the better one. You know, that's the, so. It, you know, these things are a very much personal choice. <coughs> I really believe that's a personal decision from a medical point of view, you've got everything you need. You'll have everything you, you need and you'll really have the, 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 the full ability to monitor to one, oneself in every way. And the ICDs often do another level of information, of course, than you'd get with any of, the, any of these monitor devices. Slightly different question. I normally wear an Apple Watch and I've been looking at heart rate variability. Oh, right, yep. Okay, and uh, obviously the figures on there. If you're in IF, Heart rate results. variable, it can do, yeah, yeah. So, so, false so I don't think there'd be false figures, just the interpretation of what that means to someone will be different, right? So if you're in atrial fibrillation, all of those kind of good inferences one can make from, so heart rate variability can mean different things depending on the context. It can either mean just how different, the, what the range of your heart rate is during the day. That's what it often. I'm looking at the autonomic nervous system. Yeah, and exactly so. Yeah, so you can also take some kind of quite clever maths about how each heartbeat varies and work out how stressed, how much your stress autonomic system is or how much relaxed your autonomic system is. And that's only really been shown to be accurate in people in the normal heart rhythm. And it really, I think, in atrial fibrillation, the accuracy of that is probably off. Yeah, and it, uh, less. Because the figures that is reported yeah. are higher for my age. Right? I, yeah, I think, I, I, yeah. I've got a really good uh, sort of switching heart, yeah. or the figures are off. So I'm, we, we've been having quite a few questions back and forth, which is just great. And, but I do know that we've got sort of the time going in for the last 15 minutes where we can have some Q&A. So how about I just run through the last few things I was going to just, yeah. just, just run through and then we can, can go back. So I'll just say there are these monitors available, about 400 quid, which do two-week non-stop monitoring work with a chest strap. And we'll do similar things to those patches, but are reusable and these, these are tailored for, for athletes. And I think this one's, this is the Frontier X2. There's a 
a friend of mine who's a um, champion cyclist who, you know, this is on his radar as being something which will be ideal for, ideal for him. So last things to mention are digital monitoring via the phone apps where you put your finger over the phone. Similar to those bands, but even less accurate, right? So where they use a the phone's flash to work out the pulse rate, kind of okay for screening and okay for monitoring if you want a binary, yes, your heart rhythm is regular, no, it's not, let's do an ECG. They're okay as far as that goes, but everything else is a little bit, it's a bit speculative. And they, you see things like this on the App Store, nice ECG on the symbol, says it's got to measure it, log your blood pressure, record your oxygen levels, and underneath this is a toy, you know. It's like, um, they're not that, they're not, if you don't have anything else, they're better than nothing, but you have to be aware that this is not, they're not really medical, medical level. Um, glucose monitoring, that's super interesting, right? I've not tried a glucose monitor, a continuous, you know, continuous glucose monitor, but a lot of people have, and they say that even in, for diabetics, they say that is life-changing. For people without diabetes or with pre-diabetes, people say that can really be the key thing so they understand the effects of different things that they eat. So these are something, the Freestyle Libre, which says it's a consumer device, or the Zoe. You know, you might have seen adverts for the Zoe app and things like, things like this. And they'll say, well, this is just for monitoring. It's not a medical device. OK, last week I went to the factory. I was in California this, when I went to see about the pacemakers and so on. And they went to the factory where they make these things. And they said, yeah, it's exactly the same that we put in packets for the hospital ones and, and for the consumer ones. It's the same factory. They just change the label on the two things. And one is $50 and one is $200. <laughs> yeah. OK. So I've got a couple of slides just saying about how the ECG, sort of what would do to recognize the ECG. And I think people often find this just a tiny bit interesting because we all see these tracings and so on. It's good to just understand. Um, has this got a pointer on it? It doesn't, doesn't, I don't, has it got a laser pointer? Oh, a very tiny laser, there we are. Um, okay, so the atrium, the sinus node, the heartbeat starts up in the top chamber, spreads around the heart, can't get down to the bottom chamber because you've got the two valves in the way, so it goes down this conduction system, down to the heart. Heartbeats. You see that on the ECG, um, so that P wave, that first thing here, is that top chamber depolarizing, so the sinus node depolarizing the top chamber. You've got a little gap here while it goes down the conduction system, and then a big spike is the main chamber pumping, and you have the relaxation wave, the T wave, after that. And so that's basically, when I see an ECG, that's the first thing that's the first thing I look at. Um, and AF is the thing that we've spoken about a lot today, and I think, I gather a lot of us have atrial fibrillation. Um, atrial fibrillation basically is a chaotic rhythm, mainly in the left atrium. Um, and, uh, you know, it, the really downside is it can accelerate the symptoms, of, accelerate symptoms of heart failure. It's livable with, and we can treat things with medicines and drugs and regularize things in other ways. And some people are very fortunate. It doesn't cause those problems. But we are getting better and better at treating them. And then we look at the tracings of people with atrial fibrillation. Here's one from a patient of mine, um, which is where you don't see that clear P wave. And then each beat is a different space from the next one. That's because you've got these crazy rhythms. Da -da 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 firing down that uh, little pathway. Um, and uh, these watch traces are good enough to see, if it, even if it's coming from somewhere else, you can see more curious and interesting things. Um, I think it's probably, oh, and I should say atrial fibrillation is treatable, right? This is, uh, um, I think this is, uh, she let, this lady said, oh, you can use my photo. She sent me this the day after I did her ablation. Uh, for, I did her procedure, and the next day she sent me this photo, and she said, well, well so well. So she was in atrial fibrillation. She, she now isn't, but that was her trace of atrial uh, fibrillation. Um, and um, uh, so, yeah, we have treatments such as medication to prevent strokes. We've got pacemakers. We've got 
Um, some people are ICDs also, we use as pacemakers, and uh, ablation treatments, which is now really a day case procedure, and we're getting not, not perfect results in everyone. It very much depends the amount of time people, the amount of progress of scarring in the heart, but it's still a really good treatment for many, many people. Um, okay, this was a question we had, but I would say, um, just to go through the pitfalls of all these monitors, I think one thing you brought up by, was, it, it was about, is this accurate, is it safe with an ICD? The answer is yes, it's totally safe, but sometimes if the ICD is pacing, the accuracy of the interpretation can be significantly reduced. Okay, so it can say it's one heart rhythm and it's not actually, it's the ICD or pacemaker uh, working. Um, sometimes extra beats can be misinterpreted, particularly by the pulse, uh, by the pulse-based ones, either as a low heart rate or as atrial fibrillation. So people said they have atrial fibrillation and they don't. Um, and, uh, and beta blockers, if people are on beta blockers, their heart rates can be below that set level. And I would say there's still a role for cardiologists, okay? So you can't just say, <laughs> I'm never gonna go and see a doctor again. Okay, um, so, okay, my recommendation is just to finish up and then questions as well. Everyone asks which is best. Uh, well, I think everyone should have a home blood pressure monitor. Sounds like we all do, right? We've all got our own home blood pressure monitors. Um, if you collapse, then that's all the inpatient stuff. And if you have palpitations or other symptoms, then it really is worthwhile uh, being able to monitor your own. And I would suggest that EC ones with an ECG are significantly better than those just pulse-based ones. Um, I've got some, a few other bits that I've sort of skipped past, but what about an opportunity to ask some more, more questions then at the end? First, a huge thank you for including so many of our questions in your presentation. So, round of applause, please. <laughs> Malcolm, we've only got a couple more minutes left of the session. I think you've answered a number of the questions that were pre-submitted. There was one that, that I was really interested in in before I just go over to the audience questions and I think I think you prepared for it and that's can home ECG monitors be used to screen for cardiomyopathy okay great question can a home ECG monitors be used to screen for cardiomyopathy I think home ECGs for screening for cardiomyopathy is not proven I've got to say I don't think that is a good screening for cardiomyopathy I think to screen for cardiomyopathy, we need a proper ECG. And current interpretations of the ECG are not why, I mean, we hear in the research field that it is possible to diagnose many different types of cardiomyopathy from the 12 of ECG. That has not worked its way through to clinical practice so much. And I think you can say, right, there's a 12 of ECG, there's some abnormalities, and we do an echocardiogram or an MRI scan, but really the echo is far more available. So I think a combination of those two, if you're gonna screen someone, an ECG and an echocardiogram, do it properly, get it right. Thank you, time for one more question, if anyone's got one more question. I have a question. Well, hold on I'm a second. Really curious. Thank you. So my wife's had the 24, the seven day, and the zero. Yes. I'm wondering what happens to that data. What I mean is I assume there isn't a human looking at five miles of paper yeah, looking for a pattern. Is, does it yeah. go into a computer? How does it work? Yeah, great question. Okay, so I think in what you point to is an assumption that I always make that this is all digital stuff behind it. I mean, basically, we rely on this 48-hour halter up to 72-hour, then really it's comes on a computer screen and we have a technician click 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 so you can see about you know 20 minutes at a time on one screen and if there's things that jump out of you it is alerted so there was a pre-screening process right and so seeing normal ECG is fine and then I'll go right click select that bit click select that bit as examples and then the consultant will get a report Set with the example bits they've 
chosen to, to select. So there's a bit of a man, even now, there's a bit of a manual process after the screening thing. You remember the implantable recorders I was saying? So that was a huge problem to start with because they are connected and they're listening all the time for two years. And so the false alerts have been maybe the biggest bugbear because you don't want to get it wrong either. It's all fine to leave it to a machine to try and work it out, but you've got to have another screening thing. So there's a, that's another subscription that these companies have then said, well, you know, this is actually a bigger cost than we had thought. So then any time there's a basically quite a simple alert-based system that sends a transmission and then there's a team in the Netherlands who will look at the, say, yes, this is a real thing, and then send that to the, the hospital. So there's a, manual, there's a manual process in it still. But where does the hospital get back to you? If it's a, uh, not a well, you'll find the letter, won't you? It'll say, <laughs> to your old address, probably. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, no, actually, no, in, in, all, in all seriousness, in, in BART's what happens, I'll speak for our own BART's whips across, so people have these devices. If there's an important medical thing, every day these things are, we have a person every day screening these things. If there's anything life-threatening, they will give a phone call and say, come up to the, the hospital. So I think actually we run, even though I tease about the NHS, I think we run a great service at BART's and 